teas, bunting, the local shop, quaint church spires, and games on the green. The sights and sounds of the classic village scene. Everyone has their idea of the perfect village. I know I do. But I've lived in a village for almost 40 years. Come on, girls! And I know there's more to village life than the picture postcard suggests. So I'm setting off again to explore the world of our smallest communities. Don't you envy me? I'll travel by land. It's colder up here, Hedge. By water. He's a biggie, and he might be. <laughs> and by air. Heavens above. To find the characters and communities that have made a big impact. My window on the past is the Batsford Guides, whose words and pictures from the 1930s tell a story of village life. But I want to find out what it means to be a village today. Oh, they're going to throw him into the sea. And discover just why we are so passionate about this quintessentially British institution. Beautiful, isn't it? country, more than four million of us live in a village. From open fields to coastal cliffs, our smallest settlements tell a diverse story of how we live today. On this journey, I'm in a region quite distinct from any I've been to before. Far north of the border, the scale and majesty of Scotland is something my guides captured rather well. And there's no shortage of majesty here, in rural Aberdeenshire, along the banks of the River Dee. Dee side's special to me. My Aunt Moll, who was my godmother, my mother's cousin, married a Scot called Harold Aiken. And so in my school holidays, I used to come up and stay with them. And I had the most wonderful times. I know Deeside is a fascinating place. From the fertile lowlands to the grandeur of the Cairngorms. For someone coming from London, Deeside was wild and adventurous, with vast open spaces and few people. But for 150 years, Deeside has been a place of royalty, the favorite retreat of Queen Victoria, and every monarch since. So, upstream and downstream, I'm exploring what is now Royal Deeside to visit the people and places that make up this unique Scottish valley. Two hundred and fifty years ago, a road was built adjacent to the River Dee. It's lovely to travel along. Not too fast, so you can take it in, not too much, of course. This road made Deeside accessible for the first time. And 30 miles upstream from Aberdeen, it transformed life in my first stop, a Boyne. In the 19th century, a Boyne quickly became the largest village on Deeside. Victorian postbox. The road was joined by a railway and the village became an important crossing point over the river. Mm -hmm. 
once you leave the main road, the atmosphere begins to change. It's quiet and beautiful. And the landscape changes too. There, I think, is my first real mountain, Craig and Dinny, of 1,100 feet. I'll see what Mr. Batsford has to say. The road to a Boyne after the soft hillsides was hard and unexciting, although it passed through a dense, cool wood out of reach of the sun, and one could stand on the bridge over the Dee, enjoying for the first time the sweep and rush of a great river. And there it is, so beautiful. Looks wonderful from here, but, um, I believe there's a better way to see it, and I'm going to try that. A boy in his home to the Deeside Gliding Club, where the local mountains, I'm told, contribute to excellent gliding conditions. Oh, good afternoon. David Innes is one of the club's instructors. Why should you have gliding here in the middle of Deeside? It's the most marvellous place for all-round soaring potential. People have set UK records for gain, height gains here. Really? The two-seater height, height record was 38,000 was phoned from here. Because the... Uh, it, the because there's rising air comes over the mountains at all times of the year. It's like the pebbles of the stream. The air flows over, it starts to oscillate. And, it, and if you get in the upper part of the air, which is going up, upwards, you can go from going for tens of thousands of feet. How well, long can you fly? Uh, some of us have flown for over five hours to, get, to gain a badge. And the glider over there on Wednesday, it was airborne for ten hours. It, now, look, I don't need a badge. Indeed. But I would rather like to have a little Indeed, fly. absolutely. Okay, over your shoulders. I'll take the weight. Someone had thinner legs than me. Excellent. There we go. Now, are you comfortable? Would you like a cushion? Yes, I'd love a cushion. All right, now, it's rather like a sports car, so it's a rather reclined seating position. Oh, that's nice. There. Right. Good. Coming over gently. Yes, very nice. Oh, that's good. Smoothly. Do I do anything? No. And it's locked. It's locked. Roll out, please. Oh, it's nice, all these people pushing me. It's lovely. I, I'm enjoying this. Good, good, good. Yes, this is good. I like seeing other people working. Indeed. Yes. Ready to fly? Clear the area. Cable on, please. Right. Wow, it's quite fast. Just Wherever. And staying low, behind the tug, wave right. to the guys. I did. Okay. And right. then uh, now and we just we fly are. in formation behind the tug. I love it. Gosh. Oh, and there's the river. Indeed. Oh, crikey, that's amazing. From up here, I can see just how different Deeside is from the other areas I visited on my village travels. And the river twisting, turning beneath us. Oh, heavens, that is wonderful. Communities are few and far between. Fascinating. Passing the village of Dinnet on our low on our right hand side. Right. You can just see the right, you can see the white building in the garage. Yes. yes. It's, a, it's a small community. Dinnet may be small, but it marks the entrance to the Cairngorms National Park. Beyond, the mountains get higher and the villagers get fewer still. It's a full seven miles to Ballata in the distance. Upstream, you'll find fewer than eight people for every square mile. Oh, and look at the mountains! Aren't they glorious? 
you can see all the curves and the wonderful shapes. Apart from mountains and the river, the other important factor here has been the huge estates. Vast swathes of land over half a million acres, predominantly owned by about 10 people. Gorgeous. And in the distance, I can just glimpse Loch Nagar, the highest point on the Queen's Balmoral Estate. That is the centre of Loch Nagar, on the nose, virtually on the horizon now. Wow. You see, the poet Lord Byron lived in this area for a time when he was a child, and he wrote a poem about Loch Nagar. England, thy beauty is a tame and domestic to one who has roamed over mountains afar. Oh, for the crags that are wild and majestic, the steep frowning glories of dark Loch Nagar. Landing area is clear. Speed's good, straps tight. Yes. OK, good, good, good. And uh, just stopping the dive. Holy bump, bump, bump. Very good land. No, oh, I've done better. I've done better. There we go. The wing will eventually drop. I'll make sure it's the left wing. Oh, oh. and there we are. Brilliant. Excellent. Gosh, that was lovely. Marvelous. Terrific. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. My ears it. have gone. But it was wonderful. I can hardly get up. <laughs> may, I get, may I offer you a hand? Yes, but I don't think I'm going to be able to get up. <laughs> well, shall we, shall we? I think the camera has seen enough of me trying to get out of a glider. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next, I'll be dropping in on Deeside's most regal village. Even in this age of selfies, the royal family are left pretty much alone. I'll be checking on the Queen's vegetable garden and inspecting Prince Albert's Highland handiwork. It's magnificent, isn't it? I'm in Scotland, exploring the villages of Deeside. It's an area I knew as a youngster when I visited my uncle and aunt. Heading upstream, I've reached the area that's seen the valley become Royal Deeside. The village of Ballata is just seven miles from the Queen's Balmoral home. More than any other, this village has benefited from 160 years of royal patronage. My Scottish guidebook is certainly very complimentary. Ballata is very pleasantly placed where the Dee Valley makes a wide sweep between well-wooded hills, one of which is Craig and Darroch. That's the one, the special feature of the locality. Groups of villas and cottages cluster round a green, in the centre of which the new parish church of the Church of Scotland rears its graceful spire. I couldn't have put it better myself. In 1866, Ballater became the end of the new railway line from Aberdeen. It was hoped to take the line further up the valley, but new Deeside resident, Queen Victoria, wasn't amused by the prospect of trains trundling past her castle. So that was the end of the line, in every sense. Trains terminated in Ballater for exactly a century. But in 1966, Dr. Beeching's axe fell leaving the old station building to become one of Ballater's heritage attractions, complete with a replica of Victoria's royal carriage. 
Sadly, just a month before my visit, the station was almost entirely destroyed by fire. A very sorry end to the building that shaped modern Ballata. There are still plenty of villagers, of course, who remember the days of royal trains and excited well-wishers. The quiet little D-side town of Ballata comes into the news every summer. It's the station where the royal family arrive at the beginning of the annual visit to Balmoral. For a few weeks, there'll be a real rest for the Queen. We all wish her and her family a very enjoyable holiday. Hello, I'm Penny. Pleased to meet you. Pat Crawford and Sheila McFarlane saw all the regal comings and goings. After the royals went in their cars on up to Balmoral, we, we'd run over to the fence over there and we watched them unloading their luggage. Ooh, and there was, what was it like? They had the trunks and it said the nursery or whatever. Really? The little yes. tricycles when the children were small, really? that went on as well. And did all the dogs come off as well? Yes, yes they the went off. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> and into the cars, yes. Years later, on a visit to the village, Prince Charles reminisced about those childhood journeys to Deeside. He said that there was no place on earth like Deeside. But even though everyone came to see them, they still went around and still go around shopping in. The, the young village. ones come down. Camilla comes down. She does. Bless the me. Duchess of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I actually work for the McEwens of Bath and Prince Charles opened the shop for us. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's nice. The shops in Ballata are the closest to Balmoral and some are by royal appointment, a mark of distinction for supplying the royal household for at least five years. It's lovely talking to people like Pat and Sheila, who've lived in the village for most of their lives. You get a real sense of what the place is like and its feel. And it strikes me that even in this age of cameras and phones and selfies, that the royal family are left pretty much alone. That's probably why they love Deeside so much. Privacy and escapism were two of the biggest attractions for Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, when they first visited the Highlands in 1844. The scenery reminded Albert of the wooded mountains of his German homeland. Just four years later, they found a home for themselves right here on Deeside. Not so much a home, as an entire estate. On the south side of the Dee, there's now 50,000 acres of royal land. And at its heart, one of the most recognized buildings in Scotland, Balmoral Castle. This has been the private residence of every monarch since Victoria. The grounds and gardens are open to the public in spring and early summer. My first visit to Balmoral was rather unusual, though. My uncle was the Deeside vet, and when the royal corgis were under the weather, he would get the call. He thought it would be rather nice for me to come along when he had to attend to a dog, so he put me in a long white coat, and I was supposed to be his nurse. He told him of a story of arriving one day. He rang a bell, there was a bank of bells, and no one came, so he waited and waited. And eventually a member of the royal family turned up and said, oh, are you waiting for someone? Is no one looking after you? And he said, no, but don't worry, I've rung a bell. And he said, oh, well, look, I tell you what to do. Why don't you ring all the bells? Someone will turn up eventually. <laughs> the impressive size and scale of this Highland residence owes much to Prince Albert. 
Balmoral was once a pretty little castle in the old Scottish style, according to Victoria. It stood right here on the present lawn. But Albert set about designing a Scottish fantasy, fit for his queen and their growing family. And just as it did in Albert's day, working life on this estate faces a particular challenge. Namely, from August to October, when the estate's owner is in residence. I'm told the Queen comes on holiday with her own florist. So I'm heading to the cut flower and vegetable garden to see how the head gardener, Alan Beedy, is coping. I'm Penny. Nice, Hi, nice Penny. to see you. It's difficult enough gardening anyhow in this country. How do you make it happen at the right time of the year? What you've got to do is think of when the Queen's here, when the, the court's here, and then work your way backwards. Well, last year, our sweet peas were ready a lot earlier than what you would normally expect. You know, the florist usually looks after the sweet peas because obviously you've got to keep deadheading yes. them and deadheading yes. them. So the florist does that, but these were all flowering before the florist came. <laughs> so it looked brilliant when the visitors were here, but as soon as when the, the court was here, when the queen was here, they were already going over. <laughs> so that was a bit of a panic, you know, broccoli and cauliflower and the lettuces. We have several plantings yes. to time it that way. The first chef might want 50 kilos a time of potatoes and you're thinking, right, OK, and <laughs> hundreds of lettuces and all this stuff. And you're thinking, right, we've got to make this last right through until October and then the next chef will come up and thinking, blind me, there's hardly yes. anything left for me. <laughs> you know, so that can, that's quite an interesting thing right. too. When the royal family come up here, are they interested in the garden? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. This vegetable garden here was the Duke of Edinburgh's project. Was it? He had it moved from elsewhere on the state to this site. Right. So he's really interested. Right. He comes down on a regular basis, if not daily. I saw the garden in front of the castle. Are some of these going into the beds out there or not? Most in this glass are here are pot plants for the castle, for the they bedrooms are. and right. for when the courts here. We change the plants over every oh, week. Well, there's a lot of pelagoniums, so that's kind of traditional Victorian. Absolutely. I always say there's a reason why plants are popular. It's because they're good. That's, well, I yeah. kind of think the same way as well. Yeah. Oh, good. Inspired by memories of my first trip here, I'm heading back downstream to a place I know well, the home of my aunt and uncle. Here we are. Welcome to Bankery. Please drive carefully, of course. I don't really recognize any of this. Gosh, it's enormous. Bankery has changed a great deal since the 50s and 60s. The boom in North Sea oil has seen it become a commuter town for Aberdeen. But I've come to Bankery today to visit my cousin Bill, who has lived here all his life. We can catch up on old times. One of my abiding memories up here was I used to go out with Uncle Harold when he went on his rounds. But he wasn't only a vet; he was the vet. He was the vet. There wasn't there wasn't a vet in every village by any means. When the Queen came up to Balmoral, oh, he was on call there too. Wasn't indeed, he? he would quite regularly be visiting Balmoral, usually to see about the dogs. But there's also a lot of royal horses. I went with him once to Balmoral. One I, of the I kind of remember that. I was terribly frightened. I thought if anything goes wrong, I end up in the tower. <laughs> Did you ever meet any of the corgis? Indeed. We had a panic one night when one of the corgis was so ill that father thought he should come home to the house for observation. Well, of course, <laughs> well, you know, you can imagine that somebody left the door door open and here's 
here's a royal corgi heading for freedom. <laughs> 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 and it disappeared out of the house, down the drive, and, and away it went. And we were patrolling around the streets of Banker <laughs> looking for this, this royal corgi so that we could find it. And you talk about the Tower of London. Father had... <laughs> <laughs> Father was very nervous for a few hours. Next, I'm dropping in on a real Scottish laird to find out about one of my favourite artists. Well, I suppose it's difficult to get sheep to stand still when you're painting. And I'll be out on the estate, learning the subtleties of gamekeeping. Are you all right? I'm worried about your trousers. <laughs> it's quite wet now. I'm in Scotland, exploring the villages of Royal Deeside. It's an area I know from my childhood, when I was captivated by the rugged charm of this mountainous landscape. Deeside isn't characterized by towns and villages like most of our country, but by vast undeveloped estates of farmland, forestry, and moorland. Serving and maintaining these estates are communities like Fingham, a village of just 400 people, dominated by the 10,000 acre Fingham estate. The land and its wild game still need managing, as it has done for centuries. The man in charge here at Fingham is the gamekeeper. I'm, I'm Penelope. Who goes by the name of Hedge. First of all, I must ask, why Hedge? Well, when I was about 16 year old, I used to have a lot of, loads and loads of hair. So let's see it. And now... Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and that's me stuck for it now. Right. I'll go and get in the car, shall I? Excellent. Hedge is taking me to Peterhill, where he believes Fingham's herd of deer should be visible this evening. There's a Land Rover to reach the 2,000 feet lookout point these days. But Hedge's highland life is still reminiscent of John Brown, Queen Victoria's favorite ghillie who guided the Queen all over the Balmoral Estate. Oh. oh, what a wonderful view. It's colder up here, Hedge. It's really cold now, but hopefully we'll see some action, some deer over the hill here. You hear How that? often would you come up here? I'm up here probably every day. Really? Yes. I'm probably quite a lot up here at three, four o'clock in the morning, just on daybreak. Are there deer in the herd that you recognise? Uh, you recognise the big stags. You do? Yes. You know, we've got a herd of here of probably 80. And do, is that the optimum number? Is well, that the a, number you like? Yes, we would do with 80. So we would bring that herd down to 80 really? every year. I think it's all to do with the balance, isn't it? Too much, then overgrazing. So there's not enough food? No, no food. Oh, oh. Ah. <laughs> now, can you see any hedge? Uh, nothing at the moment, but just right. give me a couple of seconds here. Right. Right, I found them. Would you like to have a look at this? Yes, yes, where am I looking? Oh, yes. Yes, I see them. But they're... They're walking away. Can they smell us? They'll probably smell us, I think, yes. They can? Yes. From this far? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. When some of the deer are shot, what happens to them? And everything would be going to our Fingham Farm shop, which has been fantastic, actually, because people like to know where... Their the food comes. The food comes. Where it's yes. been shot, who shot it, right. what has been eaten. 
If you were up here and you were managing the herd, yes. what would you do? Would you try and take one or two out from here? Probably not. Right. Um, yeah. The heather isn't very wet this now, so we could easily crawl down. It would take us quite a while, but we could easily do it. I'm sure you could. So could you. <laughs> <laughs> On a cold evening, I don't much fancy crawling through the damp heather to take a closer look. But crawling is all in a day's work for Hedge. Right. I'll just pull my trousers up now. Yes, that's a good idea. Right, here we go then. Right. So I'll go right down now. Right. And I'll go down as low as I can. And then you just go down like this, all the way down. Are you all right? I'm worried about your trousers. <laughs> it's quite wet now. <laughs> no more. No more. No, okay, I think that's that super. Right. I'm worried about you getting cold. Here's your jacket. Thank you very much. Please. Not at all, thank you. I get the idea. Yeah. I think so, I'm not going to join you in that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sensible idea. And your shirt is all dirty. It's all too. dirty. That's okay. Are you very cold? No, not really. Oh, Scotsmen yeah, don't get cold. Oh, yes, they do. No. <laughs> an amazing experience to be up here almost on my own and see a herd of red deer when you think hedge sits up here sometimes for hours on his own but it just does underline the importance of community and I'm sure it's very welcome to go home down the pub, have a drink and warm up. Back downhill, that Fingen community is my next stop. Except there doesn't seem to be much of a village. More an assortment of village features spread over quite an area. But then, space really isn't an issue in these parts. I'm heading to where some of Hedge's Highland game ends up. The only shop in Fingham. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Over here we have herbal foot balm crafted in Fingham. Eggs, very local eggs, Torfins, that's just down, down the road. So very few air miles. The shop is stock full of produce from the estate and local area. And with a cafe out the back, this is a real hub for the area, serving locals, visitors, and providing jobs for younger members of the community. Overseeing it all is Katrina Farkerson, whose husband's family has run the estate for four centuries. Do tourists come yeah, in? We get quite a lot of tourists. Do you? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Sort of in the and season. In the season, and we sort of notice as well. We can see the English banknotes, so we know when it's tourist season. What about the winter time? When it's snowy, then you know we go and deliver things out. So deliveries get done in a tractor, which is all a bit bizarre. But and what, what about the papers? Do they get delivered? The papers still they come on the school bus in the morning. So oh, do they? The school bus. If the school's closed, then we don't get have papers. papers. But generally, it's about five days a year we're snowed up properly. Properly. Really. Snowed up. Really. And apart from that, we tend to people tend to manage somehow. Brilliant. A tendency to snow is one feature that's brought me here to Fingham. The village was home to one of my favourite artists, someone who celebrated those local winter scenes. This also gives me an excellent excuse to meet the current landowner, or to use Deeside terminology, the laird, Donald Farkerson. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Please, come in. One of Donald's predecessors was Joseph Farquharson, the painting laird. He lived at Fingham after the First World War, 
but was better known for his paintings of sheep in the snow. You might recognize them from Christmas cards. This is a portrait of Joseph Farquharson. He's lovely with paintbrush in his hand. And he's looking terribly dressed up, isn't he? Well, yes. I don't think you'd see artists today sitting for a portrait in a bow tie and looking quite as snazzy as that. And, and you can see here, this is, this is a painting that he, he did. Farquharson sheep, but are they local to the Highlands, are they? I mean, to he, hear. He did use models of sheep as well. Uh, really? They, the, the, uh, a number of sheep were made by uh, a local taxidermist. So when you think you have seen one of those sheep before in one of his paintings, you probably have. Well, I suppose it's difficult to get sheep to stand still when you're painting. That, that's right. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. Joseph Farquharson originals are now much sought after. In his life, he had 200 works displayed at the Royal Academy and was prolific in committing deicide to canvas, including, of course, his own estate here at Fingham. These are all recognizably Fingham scenes. Yes. Which is rather nice. You can walk around and you can see he had his uh, mobile caravans so he was painting on plein air and he would move his caravan to wherever he wanted to be as well as being a very important and successful artist he still had this enormous estate to be laid of that that's right i mean you can see in this picture and here, the, the, the staff that he was, uh, he was wow. maintaining. Wow. Um, that's him down sitting on the grass down there. Um, wearing a kilt, I think. Yes, yes, yes as I imagine he probably did a, a lot of the time. Yes. For 17 years between the wars, Joseph Farquharson maintained this unusual juggling act. Part estate manager, part respected artist when he died in 1935 all the tenants came out and there, there was obviously a great love and respect uh, for him i think you see that in his pictures you know there, there is a sensitivity uh, yes. uh, a love of the countryside around yes. him Over on the north side of the river, I'm heading to a slightly larger community. Furthermore, Tarlan feels like a classic village. As you can see, it's set round a square, and all the buildings are typical of northeast Scotland. And there's quite a few businesses here, too. There's a toy shop, oh, and a pharmacy, oh, and a hairdresser. And let's face it, we all need a hairdresser at some time. Don't be fooled by the empty streets this evening. There's a thriving community of 500 here. And tonight, a fair number of them are in the pub. Fiddle playing is as much a D-side tradition as bagpipes and kilts. Queen Victoria was a big fan. And Tarland has a habit of producing world-class players. Today, the local star is Paul Anderson. Now, this is your local pub? Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose if the session here has been going on maybe 20 years at least, but certainly there's been a regular session here for quite, quite a long time. And do time. you know how many musicians are going to turn up? Mm, you never have a clue. Uh, in the middle of winter, I've been sitting here with two folk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Which is, it's nice in itself because yes. you could play stuff that you wouldn't normally right. play. Right. Um, and I've seen up to 18 musicians. Really? Playing them. We've, had, we've had all sorts. We've had um, Canadians, Americans, an opera singer from Wales. We had a, a Rastafarian trumpet player a couple of months ago. Really? <laughs> so you can never tell who, who's <laughs> going to turn up. So it's, it's never, never the same. Tarlan's fiddle playing tradition started in the mid 19th century with Peter Milne, who became known as the Tarlan Minstrel. Not only did Milne perform, but his compositions are widely considered among the finest of all Scottish fiddle pieces. He was a professional musician and um, da a dancing master, because for fiddle players at that time, that's, they went hand in hand. Of course, one's seen all those pictures, yeah. haven't you, yeah. of, of the dancing fiddlers. He led orchestras in Aberdeen, Leith, Edinburgh, and got as far afield as um, Manchester, where he was. Did he? Yeah, he, he led an orchestra there, and he had a successful career. I mean, he, he played for Queen Victoria at, at Balmoral, where he received a, a gold medal for his efforts, which must have been suitably impressed. But you've played for the Queen. Yeah, um, it's, I'm sometimes asked to play up at Carthay Church um, during the summer. Really? For the service, so um, I've played for the Queen a few times. Right. She's a little bit intimidating. <laughs> but, um, uh, but she doesn't play the fiddle. You must no, think that. Should... No. <laughs> Tonight, though, it's a local command performance. I suspect this is Paul's favourite place to perform for his friends and neighbours. Isn't it wonderful to see a pub full of people, musicians, all enjoying themselves? I've been speaking to some people who are local to here and they come every week. That's village life for you. I visit the upper reaches of Deeside, where as a teenager, I attended the famous Highland Games. I haven't been here for 60 years. That's a terrible admission. <laughs> and I see how the younger generation are embracing Deeside traditions. My cheeks were... <laughs> yes, exactly. My journey through the villages of Royal Deeside has brought me to the upper reaches of the valley. All along this road, you feel you're following the river. It keeps coming in and out of view, twinkling away in the sunlight today, which is glorious. Deeside's highest village is well known for its highland traditions. Rema. How are you? <laughs> Very well, thank you. It's a pretty village, but Rema's history is, like the local landscape, wild. The Cairngorms were the territory of the Highland clans, the kinship groups that once dominated law and order here. Victoria and Albert built their fantasy castle downstream, but two centuries earlier, Bremar needed a fully functioning fortress. This castle was attacked and burned in 1689, as the Highlanders fought to have Scottish Catholic James VII restored to the throne. Bremar Castle was a government military base, keeping an eye on the locals, until just 20 years before Victoria arrived on Deeside. And on closer inspection, it's clear the castle has seen better days. 
But a decade ago, the local community made the bold move to take the building on. Doreen Wood was one of the driving forces behind leasing it from the owners. They had no further use for it. They were going to sell it. And it's really important for the community because yes. it's our only undercover visitor attraction. So we said, please, can we have it? And they said, yep, OK, you can have it, but you've got to do the repairs. And it was it in a very sorry state? It was in need of quite a lot of tender, loving it? care. When we took it over, water was pouring through the roof. So we knew we had to raise money you set about fundraising how? Well, with donations, doing various fets and fairs. We have a huge Jacobite fair here. Really? Yeah, we had some very generous donations. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, he used to come and play here when he was a child. Really? So he's got a bit of a soft spot for yeah. it. So we right. raised 470,000. That's a lot. The roof's done, but... Look at the harling. It looks so scruffy. And... The castle is now open for seven months a year and run by a team of 40 local volunteers. But there's still a daunting amount of work to do. A further six or seven hundred thousand pounds will be needed to complete the restoration and repairs. But judging by what they've done so far, I'm sure they'll succeed. A village of 400 souls acting as a real community to put their heart and soul into opening a castle as a visitor attraction using volunteers and their own initiative, ensuring that people will go on visiting Bremar and its castle. Bravo. Of course, Bremar also has an annual event that tends to bring in the crowds. It's home to the most famous of Highland Games. The Bremar gathering has its roots in ancient clan traditions. But since 1832, it has become a festival of sport and culture with, for the past century, a purpose-built arena. I came here with my uncle in September 1954. So too did the newsreel cameras of the day. Massed pipe bands give a rousing send-off to the Brahma gathering. The 20,000 spectators include the Queen, the Queen Mother and Prince Philip. The Queen has been a fixture at the gathering throughout her reign, just like her great-great-grandmother before her. Victoria was undoubtedly the VIP who made the gathering what it is today. Overseeing the famous event these days is Bill Meston, the gathering secretary. I haven't been here for 60 years. That's a terrible admission. <laughs> but it's so different, you see. There was no seating. There can't have been seating there. Uh, the only seating is the seating around the left side here. There were People standing on top of buses and everything That's around right. the arena. I can yeah. remember that. Jay Hunter's putt of 29 feet 11 inches means that he and E. Cameron tie for first place. Next comes throwing the 22 pound hammer, and this is H.A. Gray, a farmer's son, showing how to break a record. The event keeps growing, but the contests rarely alter. The hammer and the caber toss are well known. One, two, three, over it goes. Not so many realize that Highland dancers also compete for prizes. And the bagpipe players, too. Now, there are lots of very Highland events, but what other sort of events happen here? Well, we have the, the tug of war and running events, the hill race, which goes round the hill up the top there, round the cairns. It goes up and back, and the, the record's just short of 24 and a half minutes. You've got to be fit to do that, haven't you? Yeah. Mm. And Her Majesty the Queen comes every year? She doesn't at another hill race, but she does come every <laughs> year, yes. <laughs> Smaller gatherings can be found in other villages throughout the Highlands. But Royal Deeside boasts the most famous competitor of all.
Donald Dinney. Born near a Boyne at the start of Queen Victoria's reign, Donald soon became the poster boy of the Highland Games. Also from a Boyne is his descendant, Robert Dinney. What was his main event? It was all the heavy events that he did. Really? As well as the lights, you know, the running and the, the uh, high jumps, long jumps and those as well. He kind of was an all-round athlete and that was one of his claims to fame. In an era before the amateur ideals of the modern Olympics, Donald Dinney was a superstar professional athlete. He beat all comers in strength and speed contests over a career that took him on tours of America and, age 60, even to Australia. He wasn't a young man by this time. No, no. Right through, you know, into his 70s he was competing. Um, maybe not at the same level, but, but he, 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 was, so. he was still competing at a decent level. Dinny has been cited as the greatest athlete of his century, except that he was still competing in the 1900s. If the state pension had existed, he could have claimed it. Instead, he became the face of a classic Scottish soft drink. Characters like Donald Dinney have helped Highland culture become famous worldwide. And nowhere is it better displayed than in Bramar. But while I'm here, I'm intrigued to see how grand Highland traditions are regarded by the next generation. I'm dropping in on bagpipe practice. Three years ago, Jim Wood set up this group to encourage locals to take up playing. Some of these folk have already competed at the gathering. But young Callum is one for the future. Bravo. He's just celebrated his ninth birthday. How long have you been playing the pipes? For two years. Two years? Almost. But this isn't the pipes. This is called a goose. Yes. So when do you progress to the pipes? Well, I um, hopefully get them after the summer. Didn't you find you got giddy when you first started blowing? I didn't feel giddy. I just from my cheeks went... <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> does anyone else in your family play? My dad does. He's back there. No, he's back there. Oh, that's terrific. But he only started at the same time as me. So oh, did he? Mm -hmm. And is he catching up with you? <laughs> well, I think up quicker, but he practices more. Well, I think it's a wonderful tradition. Good for you. Make sure you keep the dad up to speed. <laughs> right. Marvellous to see a group of youngsters, not all of them young, suing dedication and commitment and playing their socks off, really, and keeping tradition alive. Splendid way to spend an evening. I hope they win prizes next year. It's a stirring climax to my final Deeside village. Even though it's summer, there's still a lot of snow on the Cairngorms, but there's still the Dee, which is rushing down still towards the sea. Six miles upstream from Bremar, the road runs out. And at that point, so does my journey. This is the Lynn of Dee. The river rises much further on up there, 3,000 feet above where we are, but comes through this deep gorge under the bridge, which Queen Victoria opened. The influence of Victoria has been evident throughout my Deeside journey. Her presence here saw this valley transformed 
by modern transport and by the public attention only she could bring. Royal support still endures, of course, and the people here celebrate their Highland culture with a wonderful sense of pride and fun. I suppose my overriding feeling here is the amazing sense of community I found throughout all the villages, and the fact that the villagers actually know each other right down the line. What an incredible trip I've had. Next time, I'm crossing the Weald and Downs to visit some of the prettiest villages in Sussex and Kent. It really is quintessential English village. I'll be dropping in on one of the biggest characters in the region, sitting in full evening dress with a roast chicken in one hand and a glass of claret in the other. And I'll delve into a classic village pastime. Let's hope one of these will win the ashes. <laughs>